Welcome to the Proton Guru video practice for topic 7.6. These problems will give you practice on interpreting simple carbon-13 NMR spectra. Some brief and straightforward reading to help you get ready for these types of problems can be found in the Organic Chemistry 2 Primer 2019 in Lesson 7.6. You can also find additional chemistry videos and information on how to match the videos up with your particular course textbook at ProtonGuru.com. A key study aid to help you get ready for these problems can be found in Lesson 8.1.3 of the Primer. If you know the information on those study sheets on that page, you can answer all the questions like those found in this particular video. And there are a lot of other problems like the ones we're going to discuss in this video in Lesson 8.6 in the Primer. Here's a typical type of multiple choice question where you're given a selection of molecules and a spectrum and asked to match which molecule could have produced that carbon-13 NMR spectrum. The first thing I would do in assessing a problem like this would be to look and see how many carbon signals I would expect to be produced if I took a spectrum of each compound here. First I need to recognize some symmetry here. This molecule is symmetric about that plane. So I would have the carbon in the middle give me one signal. Two methyl groups are the same as each other because they're on either side of the symmetry plane. That would give me a second signal. The carbonyl carbons would give me a third signal. The CH2s, again related by symmetry, would give me a fourth signal. And then way out on the ends, related by symmetry, again the methyl group would give me a fifth signal. I have five, one, two, three, four, five signals in my spectrum, so that's in the running. Molecule 2 is symmetric as well. One signal for the methyl groups, a second signal for the carbonyl, and a third signal for the alkyne carbons. Well, that's too few signals compared to what I actually see in my spectrum, so I can rule out possibility 2. Next, I could take a look at compound 3, and these two groups are the same as one another because you can rotate around that bond and convert them between one another, but the whole molecule is not symmetric. So I would expect those two methyl groups together to give me one signal. This carbon would give me a second signal, third signal, fourth, fifth, sixth, seven. Well, that's too many signals, so I can rule out compound three. Now I can rotate around here and interconvert the two ethyl groups so that they're the same as each other. So that those two methyl groups would give me one signal. The two CH2 groups would give me a second signal. This carbon here would give me a third signal, fourth, fifth, sixth. All right, so none of these compounds, other than compound one, would even give me the correct number of signals in the carbon NMR spectrum. So compound one is the correct answer for this problem. And you could do some sort of double check. For example, if you know there's a carbonyl carbon, those tend to come rather high in terms of chemical shift. So signal A confirms that whatever compound you looked at was in fact a carbonyl species. Let's check out another one of these. Here we have a spectrum which has eight signals in the carbon-13 NMR spectrum. If I take a look at this, I see that I have a benzene ring which has one substituent on it. So I take a look at the different carbons. One, two signals there. Third one, now these two can interconvert because you can simply rotate the benzene ring, flip it over, and see those are the same. So those two together would give me a fourth signal. Likewise, these two that I'm putting a little square beside would give me a fifth signal, and I'd have a sixth signal. Well, that's just not enough signals to give me the eight that I actually see in my spectrum. So I can rule out possibility one. If I look at possibility two, you see that I can't just flip the benzene ring over because the two sides are no longer the same. One side has a methyl group and one does not. So now I would have one signal, two signals, three signals, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine possible signals. Well, that's too many compared to what I actually see. So I can rule out possibility two as well. If I look at possibility three, it's very similar to this example two, but I have a nitrogen on the end here. Of course, the carbon NMR only sees carbons. So I'll see this carbon, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. All right, I would expect eight signals, and that's what I see. And then if I look at this, this one's symmetric. One, two, three, four, five. And of course, these two carbons are the same. 
these two carbons are the same, related by symmetry. I only see five peaks. So again, just by looking at how many signals we should get, we find that compound three is the only one consistent. So let's take a look at another one. Here we have only three signals in our carbon NMR spectrum. Compound one doesn't have a plane of symmetry, but if I rotate the molecule 180 degrees about the line I've drawn through the carbon-carbon bonds, we would see that we would still have the same molecule. So the rotation or symmetry planes allow you to interconvert different groups, making them equivalent. So those two together give me one signal. These two would give me a second signal. And these two, related by rotation, would give me a third signal. Well, I see three signals, so that's in the running as one of the potential answers. If I look at compound two, I could either rotate the whole molecule around that axis, or I could use this plane of symmetry. So this CH2 is the same as this CH2 because of the rotation axis. The plane of symmetry also shows me that these two carbons are the same, and these two carbons are the same. So all four of those are the same as one another. That would give me one signal. Then I have this carbon and this carbon related by the rotation axis. That means that I would get a second signal. Well, I actually see three signals, so it can't be this compound. If I look at example three, I see a symmetry axis here. So I have one signal, two signals, three signals, four signals. Well, that's too many signals. If I look at example four, I see a plane of symmetry here. I would have one signal for the carbon between the oxygens, a second one here, and then these two are related to one another by symmetry. That would give me a third signal. So now compounds one and four are still in the running. Now we need to use our knowledge of chemical shifts to figure out which of these is correct. We know that if we put an electronegative atom onto a carbon atom, it moves it down into this range, somewhere between 40 and 100 ppm. Compound one has an electronegative atom, chlorine, attached to a carbon. But so does compound four. Compound four, though, should have this signal attached to the oxygen and a signal for this carbon attached to the oxygen as well. We only see one signal in that region. Additionally, this carbon is in between two oxygens. So if attaching one oxygen to a carbon moves it all the way down there, attaching a second oxygen would be expected to move it somewhere out here. So we only see one signal for a carbon attached to an electronegative atom, not two, and we don't see a signal that's pushed even further out that way like we'd expect for a carbon attached to two electronegative atoms. Those are both pieces of evidence against compound four. So compound one is the most likely to have produced this carbon-13 NMR spectrum. Well, let's look at one last problem. First, we'll in analyze and see how many peaks we would expect for each compound again. We see three in the spectrum. We'd expect one, two, three for this compound. One, two, three for this compound. This compound is symmetric, so we would only expect to see one signal for the alkyne carbons and a second signal for the carbons to which the OH is attached. That's too few for the spectrum we observe. Finally, we have this alkyne, one, two, three. So compounds one, two, and four would each give us a spectrum with three signals. Now we need to use our knowledge of chemical shifts. Anytime you see a carbonyl group in a carbon 13 NMR problem, you would expect to see a peak way down here somewhere. That's the carbonyl region. We don't see anything even close to that. So that's how we can rule out compound one. If we look at compound two, we see there's an alkene. Alkenes tend to come somewhere in this range. We see no peaks in there either. So we can rule out this alkene. Now the alkyne carbons come in this area, or carbons adjacent to electronegative atoms come in this area, and we have both those types of carbons in the spectrum. Only compound four is consistent with what we observe.